So I've got my hood out here on some saw horses. I've primed it. I've just lightly took a block over it, knocked the skin off of this primer surfacer. It develops really hard skin, I found. And you gotta knock that off before you can really sand this stuff. I've sprayed it with a guide coat. You can simply use black spray paint. It, it works, kind of clogs your paper up, but it works as well. I've used that a million times. And that just gives me some contrast on the surface because it's all white. I can block this thing all day and I wouldn't be able to see what's going on. So this guide coat, black spray paint, will stay in the low spots and be sanded off the high spots and it'll show me how flat this surface actually is. So let me bring in, we'll do a little bit of block sanding. Very, very exciting to watch. And we'll see where this hood's at. So I've got three different blocks here. A 30 inch dirt block, right, for the for the majority of the hood. We've got a small block, all with 180 paper on it. That's because I've knocked the hard skin off this and I want to kind of refine this surface and a paint paddle wrapped in 180. So let's start blocking this down and see what it looks like. So with this block, just light pressure, right? I want the block to do the work. And I am just scuffing the surface to see, see what it tells me. See how we got a low spot there? We're hitting here, and it, the surface dips down, a little hole there. So we're, we'll shoot this with a, another shot of primer, because really this primer surfacer should feel that. And I'm just rolling my block around. This hood rolls around the front. I'm just kind of rolling it around, seeing what that radius tells me. Okay, so we're just a little blocking on this surface. We got that low spot out here. We're starting to hit filler there, kind of low here. So hopefully you can see that. I've blocked this side of the hood out as far as I can, and this starts rolling over pretty tight. So I can't continue to block this area with this block because all I'll do is cut a bunch of lines in it. And that's where you know your paint paddles come in. You just lay them nice and flat. You don't want to use just paper on your fingers because you'll your finger pressure will be uneven and you'll cut cut lines in it that'll show. So just Finger pressure, right? We can roll over this edge. Follow it. So something you gotta really watch out for on these big hoods and doors is how you, if you've got them off the vehicle, watch how you set them down because they'll twist. And if you do the body work with the hood or door in a twist, well, then when it's hung on the car, it's just gonna it's gonna show back up. So keep that in mind as well. I'm supported right along the front uh, support rail in this, and right along the big uh, support rail that runs across the back. So this hood should be about as flat as it'll be on the vehicle, or held fairly close to the same way it's gonna sit on the vehicle. So here's something I don't hear very often, and that is the cold hard truth about restoration work. And that is, if you try to do it for a living, chances are you're gonna starve to death because it takes so long to get this stuff back straight again. Especially on hoods bigger than this, on your old classics. You could spend days, literally days, on just a hood. And very few clients, people, you know, customers, are willing to pay a body guy a decent wage per hour uh, to, you know, bring something like this back around. The money in and auto body is in collision repair. This is a labor of love. You know, it's not that it costs a lot to get this straight, it's that it costs so much time, which is money, I guess you could say. So, you know, if you want to, if you're interested in getting into the body work scene, do collision repair, stay away from the restorations, unless you're working for people with, you know, huge budgets, because otherwise you're gonna work a lot for very little. And that's just the truth. So if you're going to fix one of these old square bodies, if it's got a kinked hood on it, throw that hood in the trash. I've seen people try to fix them. They just don't fix well, and you'll spend far more time and effort trying to fix one that's kinked down the middle, and they did that all the time. The, 
the uh, latches and stuff would get rusty on them, you'd pull and it would kink in the middle. It was like a place where they wanted them to bend, I guess, in a collision. That's what I heard. How true that is, I don't know, but it makes sense. So throw it in the trash if it's bent. Buy yourself one of the cal induction hoods. You know, this is not something that you can't get. So don't spend a ton of effort trying to fix a hood that's kinked. It's just not worth it. So I'm just about to spray what will hopefully be my final coat of primer on this hood. And for a long time, before I ever used a paint gun, I worried about these cups and getting the right mix ratio, and I know I'm not the only one. People seem to get scared when they see all these numbers on these paint mixing cups, and they, they just give up. Well, let me bring you down here. I'll show you just how simple this is, and you, once you once it clicks, I mean, it's as basic as it gets, and you won't believe you're concerned at all about it. So what we have here is a two-part product that has a four to one mix ratio. A lot of your paints and stuff will be three parts. You'll have a product, a catalyst, and a reducer. And that's why on this cup and these vertical columns, they're split into three sections, each one. Now, this is a one to one column, a two to one, a three to one, and what we're gonna use is the four to one column, but we've only got a two part product, so we can disregard one of those columns altogether make it simple so they did not design these cups for rocket scientists to use they designed them for painters who have inhaled untold amounts of paint so even though this is a little bit tough to explain it's super simple so if we add our product up to let's say the number three then to get one part catalyst in there we would add that in the second column up to the number three so you can see there's a spacing there that basically equals four to one ratio and that's between any of these numbers all of them just are a level in the cup they don't mean anything so if we put in five parts of our product well then to get a one part catalyst added to that mix we would pour catalyst up to the number five Hopefully that makes sense. It is so simple. Please, please pick one of these up and just look it over and you'll get it super quick. A little tough to explain, but like I said, it's not rocket science. All right, so we're in our four to one column here and I'm going to pour in enough product to get me up to the number three. And now we have to add our catalyst. And because we went up to the number three, we're going to go up to the number three with our catalyst. Boom, that's it. That's how easy it is to get a four to one mix ratio. You want to mix this stuff up really good but you don't have a ton of time stuff sets up pretty quick and if it sets up in your gun you're in trouble always filter product so I just sprayed this entire hood and forgot to push record but you get the idea it looked like this all right so I just got done spraying primer on the hood it went extremely well and I want to give you my three cents worth of non-professional advice before you even mix product to spray, have your plan ready to clean your spray gun because you don't get a lot of time with this stuff. Don't mix up more than what you're gonna spray. About a gun full, in my experience, is about it. Then this stuff starts to brick up. And if you let this stuff set up in your gun, I mean, it's done, basically. Imagine pouring this full of body filler and letting it 
set up rock solid and then trying to clean it out. Hmm. I'm not gonna. So don't let this stuff set up in your in your spray gun. And what I've found that works extremely well for cleaning this up anyway is this Super Tech Carburetor Cleaner. It's got the little nozzle so you can spray all the little air horns out, right? You want to disassemble it, obviously. But it works really well. You do not have to have an automated gun cleaner like you see the guys on you know these professional shows using. Just have you some good quality rags like I've got and you will be good to go. So there you go. That's my three cents worth of advice. You don't even have to have a gun like this. You could go to Harbor Freight, buy you a $20 gun, shoot this primer, and sand it, and you'll have just as good as, as results as somebody probably spraying in a booth. And that's, I don't think that's a exaggeration. You know, so read plenty of posts and stuff about guys doing it. So there you go. You know, put you something in primer, you know, make something look nice. You can do it, and you can do it in your driveway. I'm looking at a rotisserie. Are you? I may. They got a pretty good deal on them. You can buy them, and they finance them. You sure. know, or you don't have to. Buy Could them you like not that. build one, Rick? I ain't got the time. Man, this one here, they it is so nice. It's got the bigger wheels on it, so you could roll it around easier. It's a. Uh, I'm thinking about buying it because I'm I'm going to use it on this El Camino, and then I'll use it on my last one, which would be the '70 Camaro. So that is a factory tack and factory air in this thing, or dealer installed air. Mm -hmm. Let's look under the hood. Doors sound like old doors. Don't they do. lights it was always hard to keep working on the hood mm -hmm. open with the hood yeah and probably. it seemed like they should have run a ground wire instead of trying to ground it there ground it somewhere else right on the on the but chassis and they, they just ran a hot wire up i think they're all working now though she looks pretty good Pretty straight old truck. Not too many of these out there. It's all original parts too, that's the thing. Yeah. As far as body panels. I'm giving you some incentive to work harder and harder on get yours looking good. Yeah. You're going to get to this point where you're going to think all this hard work and then one day you're going to come out here and you're going to paint it and you're going to feel like, wow, I'm done. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> it hits you. Yeah. Kinda. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's get this beast outside. Now, because I've got a lot of areas on this truck that uh, have been sanded down to bare metal, I've been trying to keep it in the shop where it's somewhat uh, temperature controlled, not temperature controlled, but the humidity has been controlled in here, which is, you know, the big thing. Keep the moisture out of the air so we don't get a bunch of flash rusting. We already got her, we already got her draped up and we can just fold this stuff back Roll it outside and unfold it again. We can fold it back down and shoot our primer. I like this plastic if you're shooting primer. I wouldn't necessarily uh, suggest this stuff when you're painting because flakes, your overspray builds up on it. It waves a lot from the air from your spray gun. Little 
dried uh, overspray flies off into your paint job. Use paper when you paint. You can use plastic when you're shooting primer. You know, that's just my opinion. I'm not an expert, but I've seen that. Makes sense. Heard people talk about it. And I have experienced it as well. Boom, outside. So the plastic draping on the truck is from Amazon. It was picked up for me by a viewer. Appreciate it. My Life Unit is the name. Tape and drape. Pretty good stuff, I have to say, even though it is not very expensive. Three different sizes, 22 inches, 43 and 59. Folds out, right? Nice and sticky, much stickier than you would think for a cheap product like this. Definitely pleased with this stuff for, you know, shooting primer. So even though I'm just shooting the back of the cab and the cab corners here with primer, you know, you think, you know, you mask off this much and spray it. Not a good idea. That stuff travels in the wind. It'll settle out on everything. It's more invasive than what you would think. So tape off everything that you don't want overspray on because otherwise it's going to get it. Move to the back. Oh man, it didn't mix up enough. But that's okay, I'd rather mix up too little than way too much of that stuff. It's not cheap.
spray it on the back of the cab. Whew, wee, that is it. I get to pour the uh, pour the sweat out of my mask. So this roof is super close. I got a couple little low spots that are just like a layer of primer low that I want to you know, spray one more time and then block this thing and it will be at least to the point that I that I want it. Never perfect, but you know, nothing is. So I want to try to encourage those who are interested in doing this kind of work to maybe get out there and you know do some of it for yourself, or at least try. Start on a bicycle or a motorcycle, something that has a lot less surface area and requires less dedication than an old vehicle. But you know if you've got the space to do it, a driveway, right in your garage, you could do it in a dorm room. But I wouldn't a bicycle that is but I wouldn't suggest it. It's pretty dusty. But you'd be amazed how nice you can make something just with a little sandpaper, a little primer, a little paint. And even if you're not that great of a painter, have somebody else that is paint it, right? You do all the legwork, all the expensive stuff, the time-consuming work, which is filling dents, priming, you know, block sanding, and then let somebody else take care of the painting, you know, if you're not that confident. This is what's expensive. It's not necessarily spraying the paint. It's all of the work that's before that. So, you know, every bit of information that you would ever need is right on Google. I use it all the time and I make sure to read the instructions on the products that I come with because they've already done the research and they know what it takes to get their product to work well. So there you go, looking pretty good. You know, get out there and start one of these projects for yourself. Yeah, definitely feels good to see them all come together. So the cab is in primer, although I didn't miss a couple of spots, a couple little dents and stuff on the side of the cab, but I worked those and in the morning I'm going to pull this thing back outside because in the morning will be Saturday when I have time to work. I'll pull this thing outside, shoot it again with primer, block it out, and then it should be ready for its final coat of urethane primer. Right now we're just shaping and then you know, we're close to ready for color. Still got to work the bed and stuff. And speaking of the bed, I want to say thanks to the guys and gals who responded to my question last week regarding, uh, you know, looking for a short box for this thing. I knew it was a long shot and that if I found one, it would be a miracle. And guess what? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't find one. But that's okay. You know, it's exactly what I expected and I'll be, I'll be fixing mine which is fine because it'll give me an opportunity to show you guys how that's done because rust on truck beds, trucks in general, you know, it, it happens even to the new ones. So nothing strange about an old 85 pickup that had some rust on it. Now these things are super hot right now. Lots of people are looking for them and the price is way up on these things, especially the short box four wheel drives. You know, good luck finding one. In the 90s, you couldn't give this truck away. Nobody will you know, nobody wanted one, but now they're kind of coming back around, making the full circle, and they're kind of popular again. So happy to be fixing this old thing up, and I look forward to getting it in color and driving it. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever. I don't want to bore you with too much body work, but, you know, it's just something I got to do and to get this thing done and out. So that's it. I'll see you next time.